Today on the RH Podcast on AI, we're going to be interviewing Mark Venna, a technology industry veteran for almost 25 years. He covers consumer tech topics, including connected health, security, PC, console gaming, streaming, entertainment solutions. I got a job as an intern at IBM doing word processing. Um, I started to learn how to uh, type at 70 words a minute. IBM had some great word processing software that, you know, they were, they were really at the forefront. I mean, you can't imagine what these systems were like in the late 70s. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Hey, Chris, how are you? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's around 10. No, it's around one where I am. It's like 10 where you are, right? Yes. Yeah, I, woke, I, think. I woke up just for you. I woke up early on Saturday. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll make sure, to, I'll make sure to, to maximize the use of your time. And no you problem. Straight back to sleep if you so desire. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, Mark Benna, and he's been at issue for a very long time. Uh, he currently uh, hosts podcast he runs uh smart tech research um and i think your firm basically it's a technology research firm uh in the consumer tech space so just talk about what's going on uh, in tech and uh, you have the smart tech check podcast which uh is it should be easy to say where well, it was hard for me to say at that moment but uh it's a great podcast like lots of and, and lots of interesting people i think you have a panel show and some one-on-ones with clients and and the other people in the industry. So um, glad to have you on and, and get your perspective on what's going on. I think it's a, it always always seems like a fiery time in tech, no matter what. But just to, I think you have enough perspective to know whether it's uh, just a bunch of hoopla or uh, you know objectively interesting technology entering the market. So thanks for coming on and uh, telling us a little bit about what's going on. I'm glad to be here. So uh, I, I do want to ask, sort of how you got into this in the first place. I always try and, and get the understanding of why people do what they do. So why? Uh, That's a great question. And I don't often get uh, get asked that. I could probably go for three hours on that. But um, the, but I'll tell you just a quick short story. The way I kind of got into technology, I was kind of like um, with, without without the, um, the, the star power. I was uh, kind of like the Matthew Broderick character in War Games. I got into PCs. At a very young age, I was my um, mom was um, ran a uh, word processing business out of our home in the late seventies. What does that mean at, at that time? Yeah, and back in those days, uh, you know, only corporations could afford the really high-powered, expensive word processing equipment, which was dedicated. I mean, like two hundred thousand dollar systems. And uh, my father was an attorney. Well, he wasn't an attorney. He was an insurance adjuster. He worked with a lot of lawyers. Lawyers are notoriously frugal. And my mother, my father thought, hey, this would be a great idea if you could, you know, outsource, this is before outsourcing become a thing, hey, have a work processing business and, you know, we lease the equipment from IBM because IBM was was really in the, in the forefront of that category. And we'll hire, and you can do work processing services like uh, uh, letters, mail merge, that kind of stuff, uh, and charge for it, you know, and it became a pretty lucrative business. Ultimately, she had to move it out of the house. It became so big. But at 15 years old, um, I started to learn how to uh, type at 70 words a minute. IBM had some great word processing software that, you know, they were they were really at the forefront. I mean, you can't imagine what these systems were like in the late 70s. I mean, the, the CP itself was the size of a refrigerator. The screen was about yay big. Nice. Um, and I got into that. And the reason why that was relevant is that when, when you uh, do business with IBM, IBM falls in love with you. And there's always, there were always IBM executives stopping by at my mother's place to showcase this. Oh, this is what a, a, a business could be like, you know, in a home. So I got to know a lot of uh, IBM people at you know, 15 years old, 16 years old. And ultimately, I got a job as an intern at IBM doing work processing. And uh, the, the thing that was exciting about it was is that I got hired making seven fifty an hour, which back in those days, I felt like I was um, a millionaire. And that this, the summer that I worked, uh, the two summers I worked in high school at IBM as an intern, they uh, announced the IBM PC. And I, at that time, I had an, a Radio Shack TRS-80, which was one of the original first PCs. I had an Apple II um, uh, back in the, I want to say 79, 1980. So I got into computers at a very, very early age. When I went to college, I on the track to go to law school. That was what my father's dream was. Yeah, I was thinking, why art history? You know, I was like, with all this tech, why art? Or, sorry, Bachelor of Arts history, basically. 
Yeah, it was basically history. And um, and the plan was, hey, Mark is going to become a lawyer because I kind of like that kind of stuff. But I got offered three jobs by, from IBM coming out of college, from Boston College. So I got into computers at a very, very early age. I was kind of in the, I, I could tell you other stories that are, are interesting, but the bottom line is I was, I was indoctrinated with computer technology from the very beginning. And I, you know, we realized, frankly, you know, that, you know, and that, again, that wasn't consumer technology, the, the technology that even when PC started to hit the ground in the early 80s, yeah, it was a B2B uh, play. And, uh, but I quickly realized, you know, hey, this thing is going to have a profound, the platform itself is going to have a profound impact on people. And then you flash forward. So I, you know, I, I worked for companies like Epson. In those days, Epson was in the PC business, but I ultimately got a, um, I got recruited by Compact Computer, and I was the original product manager on the Presario brand, which was the first consumer brand of PCs in the early 90s. And that's when, you know, the market took off, and I really got a flavor for, you know, here's how personal computers can change your life, you know? And I look at PCs today, and, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about this. You know, the PC category is a tough category right now. I mean, it's a... Um, Markets, the market is flat or declining after a lot of growth during the pandemic. Because everybody was up at home, upgrading their PCs. But that kind of that those salad days are kind of over now, and it'll probably come back after a little while after PCs become a bit older and people have to upgrade. Uh, but you know that category is a bit slow right now. The, the smartphone category is a bit slow. I was at the Apple event uh, early in the week. You know, I think Apple's trying their level best to keep the smartphone category relevant. But it's, it's a tough story right now. It's a tough business. So the atmosphere in technology, I think, is a bit, um, you know, people, are, I think, are a bit, uh, you know, skeptical uh, uh, and, and they're a bit tired. You know, um, I mean, Apple, just talking, speaking to Apple um, on a, on a uh, precise basis, you know, Apple, I think, you know, does everything it can do to keep the, the, the category relevant. They have a very strong market share presence, especially at the high end. You know, with those professional models, you know, PC uh, the smartphones now have become part of this computational photography. Um, you know, catted all smartphones, not just Apple. Samsung has, has dropped uh, that category well, and some of the technology they're putting in phones today really have completely removed the reason to buy a separate DSLR. I mean, I used to have a separate DSLR, no more. You know, and they've added they've added zoom capability to the new smart to the new iPhone. 15 pros, which is, is going to be enormously important. I, you know, I do a lot of video stuff as you probably do remotely when I'm outside and having great zoom kit is amazing. So I think that will be a terrific feature, but now will that compel people to run out and throw their phone out and go out and upgrade? Probably not unless you're, you know, you're, you're someone who um, takes advantage of that capability. But uh, but it's a tough business right now. I mean, I, and uh, it'll probably be another another year and a half or so before things start to kick back into life. I think people are very excited right now about about Vision Pro, the the new XR capability that um, goggles that that Apple announced uh, a few months ago, and they'll be in the market. They they're not in the market yet. They won't be in the market until early next year. Uh, but you know, what's interesting, Chris, is if you saw what Apple did earlier in the week when they announced these these 15 Pros. It went over the head of some people, but the 15 Pros now will be capable of capturing spatial video, 3D video. And that's a big deal because what Apple wants to make sure is that when these Vision Pros come out um, early next year, they want people to, to have the ability on day one to share videos of their family, videos of when they're outside in 3D that can be enjoyed on these Vision Pro um, goggles. And I have to tell you, the resolution on these goggles, you have to, you know, I, I, I tell everybody and their, and their brother, when they show up in stores, you have, to, even if you're not going to buy one, you've got to go to an Apple store, ultimately, put these on. Even though they're $3,500, they're not going to be cheap. And now they will not with Apple. It will blow your mind away in terms of the resolution because they literally have, it's like a 5K camera, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's a screen over each eye. So it, they, 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 they've spared no expense. The, uh, the, new, um, the new technology is great. And they're setting the table right now with, with iPhone Pros, the fifth, new 15, that will be able to capture video. Because remember, you know, you look at it from a, um, uh, you're using um, 8K TVs as, a, as, an, as an analogy. 8K TVs are great, they're still expensive, but they're coming down in price. 
there's really no compelling reason buying an AK TV because there's no AK content out there. Content out there. Most of the content on um, that is streamed or on your cable system is only 4K. So you're buying a TV that if you buy an AK TV, you're not going to be able to take advantage of it. Apple is trying to avoid that problem that, hey, when the Vision Pros come out, you'll already have well, the iPhone 15 Pro will be out in the market for then for three or four months. And day one, there's going to be lots of 3D spatial video content that people can take advantage of. One of the things that, you know, with uh, with these, I think you, know, you hit three different sort of hardware categories with phones, laptops, and, and goggles. But but because um, I I guess my the, the first thing that came to mind when you were talking was this kid I that I know he, he has a very good business. It's a multi million dollar business. He does it all from his phone mostly. I mean, it's it's the kind of business where uh, he's going to shops. He, he owns basically a um, fulfillment center for Amazon. He owns a few, right? But most of the work he does, he's texting people, messaging people, or and he can do quite a lot on his phone because he kind of has to. Uh, sitting at a desk is not his forte. Uh, so if you can run a business like that on the phone, you know that that says a lot about phone capability. Um, and then sort of, I mean, if you're if you're losing that kind of business with someone who's that busy, I'm not saying that's everybody. Uh, and I'm sure he has a laptop at home. I mean, that's not you know, negating that, but you know, there's diff there's a difference between a need and a want. Right, he probably needs his phone. He probably doesn't need the laptop. Right, that, that's kind of one way to look at it. If we talk about these goggles, is do they have that? Uh, you know, one one way I can think about this guy is uh, he has his phone and is, he's integrating with with reality with it. Right, and then these goggles they 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 kind of take you away from reality. Right, so there's they might be great for entertainment, but then when you kind of you know, is there an opportunity to make this something that you have to use at work? Or you have to use to be productive, and then can multiply your productivity. Oh, I'll, I'll I'll give you I'll give you a perfect I'll give you a perfect use case that's not entertainment uh, oriented. Um, I do a lot of video editing. You know, I do podcasts. I do all the the, the, the post production editing. And as you know, because you probably do it yourself, when you try to do that on a 13 inch, 14 inch laptop, it's very difficult because video editing by nature is a very linear type of thing. And very frequently, I'm not in right now. I'm in front of a big HP E. 45 inch widescreen, it's lovely to do video editing because I have all this real estate. Well, you don't have that advantage when you're traveling. And I'm very frequently on the road, I'm in a hotel room, I don't drag a 45 inch display with me. So what the Vision Pros can do is you can take your desktop from your Mac, and ultimately I'm sure there'll be apps out there that allow you to do this with Windows as well. And you can move your desktop into that virtual window. So all of a sudden now, I'm in a cramped hotel room, I could have several 80 inch monitors virtually in that desktop. So there's enormous activity um, advantages to that. Um, think about that being on a plane. Now, you know, I've debated this with different people that I respect and a lot of people say, well, I would not wear that on a, on a plane. Well, I don't know about that. I, I think that if you want to make- I think I would wear it on a plane actually. In fact, that might be the perfect place to wear it. It's not gonna get stolen <laughs> on a plane. Um, I, as far as I know, well, someone might try to do that if you fall asleep. But but I, I, I was. But he has this. He doesn't have where it's miracle. He doesn't have uh, too many places to go. After. I would not wear them on the New York City subway or on uh, or on a you know a bus probably. But just to be very uh, direct, I just came back from Germany. I went to IFA, which is a big technology train show, and that was a 14-hour flight on the way back. And how many movies can you watch on the plane? And by the way, the planes all have the same damn movies and. You know, there's not a lot of uh, con content that's mixed up. If I had had those Vision Pros on the plane, you know, I could have absolutely done a tremendous amount of work, you know, from my desk without, you know, with the laptop closed, because that's the other problem. You're working with a laptop on a plane because you put the, the screen up and some person in front of you, you know, adjusts the seat and all of a sudden they break the, you break the screen in half. So there's all kinds of usage models that I think are gonna be very, very compelling and productivity ones, not entertainment, sure. Yeah, well, I mean, watching a movie on a 100-inch virtual display will blow your mind. Will that justify you going out and spending? Being in the movie or being the main character. There, there will be applications like that to do that. But I, I'm convinced this is the one advantage that Apple has. And they talked a little bit about this during the um, announcement. If you believe Apple, and I tend to believe them, uh, it's not all hyperbole, they have a tremendous development developer community. I mean, they have tens of thousands who've made lots of money, Chris, developing apps for the iPhone, 
developing apps for their other devices. I mean, they have that as part of their um, uh, ecosystem. And I am convinced that the killer app, you know, you know, when you use the phrase killer app, that kind of dates me, but the, the killer app is like a Lotus one, two, three, or a visit calc in the day. And what that means to the, to the average uh, person who's never heard that phrase before is that the app is so compelling and so interesting and can change your life in such profound ways. You've got to go out and buy the, the, the platform that runs that. That was true of one, two, three. Initially only Lotus one, two, three ran on the IBM PC. And, 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 and they ran on, ultimately ran on clones, but you had to buy a PC. You couldn't run it, you couldn't run it on an Apple. Um, uh, or for, for something newer, or even, something like even like Excel, right? Excel is sort of the, you know, the modern version of some of the things you talked about that everybody knows. That's exactly right. So there is gonna be a lot of, you know, there, there's a lot of folks who, um, they're a bit, I don't know what, I wouldn't say they're, they're jealous of Apple, but you know, the, when you look, the community that I operate in, the analyst community, you know, you got people who are tend to be pro Apple, and you have some people who tend to be pro Windows, and they're all very good people and they're very independent. Uh, but Apple has been so enormously successful in most of the stuff they do. It's not that they don't have misfires every once in a while, but right, but it's rare. It's way less misfires than most other organizations. They've been quite tight, you know. Right. And most companies, by the way, would like to have the kind of success with their misfires, let alone their their. They're the ones that really take off. But for the uh, for the most part, you know, they have a very high batting average. You know, they probably are batting, you know, if they use a baseball analogy, they probably bat, they get hits eight out of 10 times. But the, the, but the reality is, is that since the PC community doesn't really have the kind of eco that, that Apple ultimately um, has, the challenge that you have is that you have kind of sluggish growth right now. And, and, and the, um, and that's what I think that's what the concern is. But I do think if I look at one bright spot in the space, I think Vision Pro could be a big deal. Now, in a strange way, I'm gonna make a statement here. I think the PC community left for Vision Pro because Apple's not gonna have 100% of that market. There's gonna be someone else that comes forward, whether it's a Samsung, probably gonna be a Samsung, or someone that's gonna come out with a comparable platform at a lot lower price because that's at the end of the day, that's what, what and you know this, I think the price is where they're going to lose a lot of cap, uh, market share, but I don't. I don't think they care. They, they never really sort of cared about that sort of thing. Yeah, they don't care. But they might, something that might be interesting is because you know the iPhone, the status symbol of the iPhone, sort of just the, the way people see it. It, it wasn't about the technology. It's, the technology is great. It's seamless. I think the thing about the iPhone is just like it doesn't cause you problems. So if you don't care about technology, iPhone is a perfect uh, phone for you, right? You just okay, it works and like. Look, it looks nice and like there's a lot of this in fact that's most people but when we talk about the vision pro because of the way you use it uh I, it, it can still go in that direction where it just mostly works uh and sort of win that but you while you're using it it you don't see other people see you use it so you know, you know what i mean so you don't get that feedback loop of this is how people perceive me because i'm using this technology i must use it always right so so that social capital they might, they might, it's going to be harder for them to, I don't know for sure, but it's gonna, it might be harder for them to sit on top of that and use that to grow in the same way they did with the iPhones. They might, there is something true, something new might come out of there. My analysis might be, you know, nothing is, uh, you can't analyze what hasn't happened, but uh, I think that's an interesting thing. I want to see how that do it. Well, you know, it's a brand new category. You know, many people don't like get it, you know, to be very honest with you, you know, guys like me, guys like you that kind of, are into technology, we get it, and we're excited. We're for, you know we're we're um, early adopters, and we love that kind of stuff. But that's not the that's not the majority of the audience. And I think what what app does better than anybody on the planet, and I say this in a very independent third party way, they can take very complex topics, and they can articulate it in such a way that people get. And by the way, they have they have hundreds of Apple stores across the country, across the globe. They they are second to none in terms of when you walk into an Apple store articulating in a very um, non-confrontational, understandable way to the average person, um, hey, here's just how this device can change your, your life. Now, I'll give you a perfect example. You know, they, they showed a little bit about this during the, the during um, WWDC when they kind of announced the, uh, the uh, Vision Pro. But I really think some type of um, XR version of FaceTime, you know, it, it, let me take a step back. If you, you recall, before Apple came out with FaceTime video conference, 
there was Skype, right? There was Skype, Skype, Skype pretty complex to use, but if you wanted a video conference, you could do it. But it wasn't really a mainstream thing. People who were doing Skype and other video conferencing, it was really more of a B2B type of thing. FaceTime democratized it. It was so simple to use. Your mom could use FaceTime, you know? And I think what's gonna happen right now, if they create some type of, uh, some type of XR version of FaceTime where you think, you know, people who are wearing these goggles, even if they're in uh, remote locations, if you think that you're in the same room with the other person, that's a game changer, especially if you're my mom, you know, she's still in good shape, but she doesn't travel a lot. Uh, she loves the FaceTime, but I suspect, and since she doesn't travel a lot, if she could see her, her grandkids or her extended family uh, in a um, uh, almost like an in-person way without leaving her um, uh, her uh, residence, that's a game changer. And you could see a lot of people upgrading purely for that capability. I think uh, this is a good, um, so, and I think with, I think this is a good segue into AI because I think to make all this happen, um, you know, usually you would have a camera and all that to sort of like, but if you have AI, you can sort of simulate human behavior or quite accurately and sort of generate it based on sort of uh, nominal cues here and there. Uh, you can make that happen. But, uh, you know, moving sort of even more deeper into that topic, I, I like uh, hear what you think about AI, not specifically about Apple per se, but so it's, it's been all in the range. Uh, in the market right now, it's sort of tapering off, uh, but the value is been proven. People are not confused that this can, can have value. Uh, so I'd love to hear where you think all these uh, these technology companies are trying to go with it uh, and see how they can uh, sort of you know take advantage of it in their own way and just not get left behind because some you know some of the companies you mentioned before. Uh, they no longer have, uh, you know, sort of market share, just simply you didn't catch up or just... No, I've, I've got some interesting views on that. It's a great topic. I'm glad you 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 pulled that into the conversation. I mean, first of all, let's face it, this incredible excitement over applications like Gen AI, you know, applications where, hey, I can ask the app, hey, write me a term paper on Napoleon Bonaparte, write it on a thousand words, two thousand words, and it does not instantly. And most of the time, it's fairly correct. You know, on a historical topic, probably very correct. It gets, you know, the Gen AI gets a little funky in other tools when it's if the information is more current. But I mean, it's amazing. Let's face it. The problem is, is that AI and Gen AI, Gen AI has kind of um, stolen the show over what AI can do. People, when they think of AI, they think of Gen AI, and that's not really uh, accurate. I mean, AI can do a lot of other things than just conjure up um, uh, text for you and write things. And there's hundreds of apps that you know, can do that with, with different levels of um, uh, capability. The thing, that, the thing that scares me most about AI, and I'm in, the, I'm in the, uh, the, 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 um, the belly of the beast out here in Silicon Valley. Every Silicon company has got this mission that they want to participate in this AI boom. And whether it's AMD, Qualcomm, or Intel to a lesser extent, well, I shouldn't say a lesser extent. I mean, they don't, they don't get the credit they should get, but you know, AI, um, Intel's got to play there. It, they're, they're doing a lot of work. We we interviewed the they, we interviewed the head of, head of AI on this podcast uh, and, and security. So they're they're doing a lot of work. Right, Nvidia is, uh, and Nvidia is doing amazing things. You, and you can see their stock. The thing that concerns me, and there's now the industry starting to address it a little bit is that AI also has the ability, and you can do a, does a variety of different things, but one of the things that gets a lot of the attention is that AI can be used to create images. You know, there's apps out there, hey, create an image of Mark um, pitching at Yankee Stadium, you know, and Babe Ruth is up at bat. It, it, there's apps out there that can, can conjure up animations, some of the more advanced, uh, if you give it a little bit of uh, um, uh, photography content, it actually could do it with, with photorealistic images. There are even apps, you know, the 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 the, the, um, the holy grail is to be able to, hey, create a video for me on these set of parameters. Now that's all great. The problem is, is that AI can, you know, in that context, AI can could also be used for some very destructive stuff, you know, and it can destroy people. It can create the deep, you know, as the, the industry calls it, deep fakes. And by the way, we're in, a, in the middle of an election right now. Wait till you see some of the stuff that's going to come out over the next uh, 12 months on both sides. It's not it's not a it's not a, a Republican or Democratic thing. I'm surprised it hasn't really happened yet. Honestly, I, I thought I thought it'd be some sort of concern. 
And the, the concern that I have is I don't know whether you can, you probably can't stop that. I mean, the social media platforms obviously will try to do their best to, at least you have to be able to identify, you know, there's a, there's a, a fine line between parody where you're making fun of somebody or, you know, which is protected by the First Amendment versus, do, versus doing something versus I'm trying to fool you into thinking that this is real. And the industry has to do a much better job of allowing the consumer or the person who's consuming that content to be able to identify it as deep fakes. And finally, you're seeing companies coming, well, we better do some things that allows a user to identify whether it's an image or especially a video. Hey, this is a deep fake, whether it's some type of smartphone application that you can, you know, you can scan the, um, uh, the image and it will give you a probability rating, whether it's fake or not. Um, but all, uh, several of the um, silicon companies and software companies now are doing things to embed some type of digital signature that you might not necessarily be able to see. You know, when you say when I when I say watermark the people, and people think that's a, a watermark on the video itself. Well, that can be cropped out. Uh, that's probably the help. You need something that e that only a, a sensor or a camera could see and identify that can't be removed that will identify the content, and that would be a powerful step in the right direction. But I will tell you, right, I'm sorry, guys. So one of, no, no, sorry. Uh, so one of the things, so one of the things I was thinking when you were saying this is, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, these deep fakes, it becomes a problem of uh, authenticity, which is kind of, is just basically a, um, uh, or authenticity or, or I guess authorization, like, you know, I guess like where can can this enter a place where and, and wherever, however that you can define that place where everything here is considered authentic, right? So then, and then it comes, uh, so 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 they they're kind of like tied together, and um, but anything, but that's kind of just security, right? And then with anything, and this is someone on your podcast said this, uh, it's a rat race with security. It's a bit of a cat and mouse game, uh, where you know the more secure you are and the more established the security protocol is, the more attack you're going to have from every direction. Um, I should, I don't know if you remember uh, or have ever seen this uh, parody, and it's a good thing you talked about parodies. Parody uh, newspaper called Onion, that the Chinese, yeah, so the Chinese government at one point. Uh, had an article that they considered to be true. I mean, I mean how true it was, it kind of doesn't, isn't the point, but, um, or how, how true they perceived it to be isn't the point. But they, they, it was enough where they could use it as propaganda or to some degree, you think Chinese or North Korean. Um, so like, it's almost like at the fringes of, of the, of, of sort of where, of the network of information is where it can have the most damage because either because they have the least concern to whether it is or isn't authentic or, uh, it is the fringes in which the technology to make it authentic isn't. So um, I think that uh, to some degree that is going to, and it already has, and, and this is where I sort of move into like um, social media fatigue, right? I, I think people kind of like just kind of exhausted with the attention grabbing uh, that they've had to endure. It's like, I you know, need more and more of your, your attention. These social media companies sort of selling attention. So how do you think that's going to evolve with this um, with, the, uh, with AI sort of proliferating and like, do you think people are kind of going to disconnect even like to a degree, degree that the social media companies aren't competitive anymore because nobody believes anything. It's just not worth it. You know? No, I think you raise a number of good points. And I, I think the, you know, part of the challenge is that, and I don't think Steve Jobs ever anticipated this would happen, but the smartphone, smartphone technology has made it, has created this um, environment where you're the average attention span where you can digest information and consider it and not just act on it has completely eliminated it or minimized um, people's attention span. You can see this when you're on a, it's zero and, and people react to things. They see something, they don't take a time, they don't take the time to digest it and say, well, is this accurate or not? Is this something that um, some people do, but the vast majority of the audience out there, they just consume it for what it is and they react to it. Now, you raise some really interesting issues on a political level, and what I mean by political level, you know, keep in mind that we, you know, America has enemies like most countries do. Not, I mean, I don't think it's like the 1940s, but we certainly have um, parties that are not too crazy about us. And you could easily get into a military conflict with someone if all of a sudden another country saw a piece of content that they thought was real that was not real and that gave them cause to do something bad, you know? 
that's kind of a macro. Right. And the inverse, and the inverse is, uh, can happen as well here. Uh, let, let me, let me bring that down to a more practical level with AI is that there have been cases about this already where people, there are some bad guys, I'm being very nice and using the phrase bad guys, have used um, audio AI to uh, call people and make, make make a person think that, oh, my daughter's being kidnapped. They have, they may have a sample of her voice. It's been completely interactive. And that person on the other line saying, what the hell's going on here? My daughter's in stress. A very famous case happened about three or four months ago. And the only reason why the, the mother on the other end of the line realized it was a fake is that the real daughter happened to call um, at the same time and she knew it was a fake. But what would have happened if that mother reacted to that by hopping in her car and in a crazy and an agitated state got into a car accident and killed someone or someone, you know, she injured herself in some way. So that is a very, you know, this kind of stuff, it's very, very dangerous. It's very dangerous. I do think the, the silicon companies and the software companies, because it has to be done in tandem, I think I'll finally think, hey, this is a big deal. So a lot of these companies, Chris, were waiting for the federal government to give them rules. Okay, you have to do this, you know? And as you know, the, the federal government, as much as I love Washington, and I say that tongue in cheek, the Washington is about 25 years behind the curve in terms of understanding technology. If you watch a congressional, if you watch a congressional hearing, and you or watch a Senate hearing, they don't know what the heck is going on. I mean, these these congressmen, the senators, they have staff, young young people on their staffs that kind of get it. But when you're talking to these senators who have been on uh, you know in office for 35 years, they're they're lucky they know how to, to send X messages, let alone understanding the implications of AI. So. Um, they have to get these companies have to get their act together because if they wait for the federal government to come together with legislation, it's going to be too late. Yeah, they're going to absolutely lose. Um, um, sort of, what would you call it? Their branding is going to suffer because there's going to be so many different kinds of problems. As a, you know, sort of what Facebook went through, where it's like if you're any kind of merchant on Facebook, you're going through a lot just to deal with them. Is but that's just because what happened with them was so. Uh, well, it was unfortunate for them. They had to deal with a lot. So like now it's the hype. The, you, your accounts get banned just, you know, for sneezing the wrong way. But, um, you know, that kind of leaves me uh, just to have this last point on security. Uh, and it, it's good that you brought up that sort of the government policies and things like that, where uh, with any kind of security, you lose a little bit of freedom. And, um, you know, and what it looks like when it comes to security is just like how many points of authentication can you really, there's no, there's no algorithms you can do and this clever thing. You, you can be as clever as you want. You can make this difficult to access something as you want. But ultimately it's like, you're the, you are the boundary for whether something's authentic. So two, two factor authentication come in, came in and they send you an email, they send you a uh, text, they send you, you know, just every digital touch point they can to make sure that it is you. Uh, with something like, uh, there's something like your voice at w where that, that could really, you know, and it's so easy to do, right? And most people are public with who they are now. Everybody's on video. So it's, it's very almost, it's super easy to do. So uh, what, what happens with that, right? Do you um, do you have to have some verification system for your, for your voice? Is that automated through a company? Like, are there, is that, is that a versioning business there? Or is this just something that uh, these companies are going to just do naturally in order to, for this technology to even get in the public in the first place. Some improvements in that area, you mentioned two-factor authentication, which is, you know, it's, 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 it's not foolproof, by the way. There's ways of kind of getting around it, but it's better than nothing. Problem with two-factor authentication is that for me, most people, when, when consumers, there's all kinds of research that will, 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 will underscore my point here, but if a, a consumer has to go out of the way and do three or four extra steps to buy something on Amazon, what they do is they disable the two-factor authentication, which completely disable, which completely diminishes the impact. I really think the and Apple's doing some interesting work. The new Apple iPhones are going to have some uh, capability where uh, it could authenticate you because you have the phone itself, and and uh, it can uh, validate you by using an eye scan or biometrics. I, I'm a big fan of biometrics, you know, fingerprint, because that that capability, it's, it's it's not a big thing. You know, it asks you for the password and you just put your finger on the, uh, like for, for example, MacBook Pro, which is what I have, you just dance your fingerprint. And that's very hard to duplicate. It can be done, I suspect the KGB. It can be done, but to, to send your, yeah, fair, yeah. 
to send your video over, over the network is it's a whole thing. It's kind of you know you can't you can't it doesn't have a digital signature. Yeah, but remember one thing about the about the hacker community. The hacker community, if you will, if you can applaud them for anything, they're very clever and they can they can roll with the punches, and they um, you know and, and and by the way, to my point, most people you know do not want to go through the extra step. Of 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 in, uh, putting like again two factor authentication is a perfect deal. I don't find it that inconvenient because I would rather take a couple of extra seconds and be protected. But Chris, let's face it. I bet here's a here's a uh, here's a. Um... No, I, I'm gonna be honest. I'm already annoyed with it. I just know it's necessary. But next time you talk to five of your friends, and you I'll just do the sample size of five, and you go to their house and and you say, okay, open up your PC or your Mac or PC. I bet out of five people who, five different people, I'm gonna bet that two out of the five have antivirus software on their PC. Most of them, most people don't even go, oh, I don't need it. You know, there used to be this rumor that if I had a Mac, I don't need antivirus software. Believe me. And that an antivirus software is what, 50 bucks a year? You know, it's not even depending on which brand you buy. Now that's not foolproof either, but I would rather have antivirus software and maybe a VPN on my computer to protect my anonymity because I don't want other people knowing, you know, what, what websites I'm necessarily shopping on and, and things like that. But the average consumer still doesn't do that. You know, they, 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 they buy a PC, they get a trial version of antivirus software, but after that antivirus software, the trial offer ends, they don't renew it. Oh, I, hey, I haven't had any problems so far, why should I do it? So, you know, consumers, I, I'm, and I'm not pointing the finger at consumers because consumers are always looking for the, the way with, with the least amount of friction to do something. And, and even if it's something that's good for them, you know, it's analogous to uh, vaccines, you know, I, and, and we'll get to the whole vaccine conversation. But, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, forget about the COVID. Before then, I should get a vaccine for the shingles. I should get a vaccine for the, um, uh, for the flu. A lot of people say, oh, if I haven't gotten sick so far, why should I, you know, why should I take that pain for two seconds for someone to stick a needle in my arm? So it's, it's kind of analogous to that. But I do think that ultimately that uh, when biometrics technology becomes so simple where it's in every device that we use and that and that biometric password is kept either locally or in some type of highly secure way that it really can't be mod can't be accessed. I do think that will be a big, uh, a frictionless way for people to get on board with being more, more cautious about security. So the one of the, the one thing I don't I, I don't really know too much about is like sort of how the semiconductor industry is, is sort of dealing with all this. So one of the things I was interested in asking about is, um, you know, sort of where where you see them trying to sort of do things and and make improvements that make. Uh, you know, make this kind of technology more efficient for them, or if they're in, or because what they have learned is that when you when these big software waves, uh, where this basically the math has to change, or the the primary math has to change, they go up and down the stack to make it feasible. Um, and, and it's it's a big software change more than it is a hardware change. It's like what kind of math is the are the are these chips prioritizing? Oh, I think they're they're much more responsive to, than a lot of people think. It's it's not as sexy because when the chips that go into a computer or into a device, that the only people who really care about that are the guys like me, maybe you to a degree, because you enjoy getting into the technical stuff that they're doing. But to the average consumer, they don't really care about oh, the, here's the new security algorithms that Qualcomm or Intel are putting into their CPU. But they are. I mean, they're, they're, they're I mean, I think they are, playing, and that's why I think in general. The silicon being manufactured today versus five years ago is much more secure than the stuff that was around, you know, uh, not too long ago. So that's a good step in the right direction. But even companies like Qualcomm, you use Qualcomm for example, you know, they're trying to, and they're they're a, a major leader leader in the AI space. They 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 um, uh, now have uh, uh, silicon basically that allows you to do AI algorithms in an offline manner, on device manner, meaning that you don't have to be connected to the cloud which is going to be really interesting that you could you could use applications like ChatGPT or others even without an internet connection you know because remember there's a, they have they, they operate in markets where the internet connectivity is not that good you know and you know you you not prioritize exactly right oh so they're doing a really wonderful job with this edge you know call it edge based ai where you don't need it you can actually um you can execute these large language models, which are billions and billions of um, 
of transactions, you can do that on a local device level without having a uh, uh, internet connection. And remember, there's also advantages from a security standpoint for doing more stuff locally than up in the cloud. I mean, not to say the cloud is not important because the cloud obviously is very, very important. But unless you're dealing with cloud applications that um, allow you to, that have their own set of security protocols, and most of them do, you know, you're always taking a bit of a risk when you put some content up in the cloud, you know? Now, fortunately, there hasn't, as far as I know, there hasn't been a major hack of cloud services like Box or Dropbox, but look what happened. You know, I just thought. I think there was one with, uh, I think there was one recently with a password service. Well, just a couple of days ago, and I, and, and I spent my, um, you know, uh, in the instance, in, uh, interest of transparency, my cousin uh, works in the, in, uh, manages the entertainment center at MGM. And MGM just had, I talked to him last night. Uh, they just had a massive, massive breach into their reservation systems that have all that confidential information about you know, the, the, the patrons that go to the uh, to the MGM hotels, and that's how they kind of distri distribute all kinds of rewards and perks. And I spoke to them last night. They are shut down right now. Their business is down 60% because most of their business is people who go to the casinos. They're, you know, they're high rollers. They spend a lot of money, <laughs> frankly, but they get perks. They get their rooms paid for. They get all kinds of comps. All of that is shut down until they can you know, resolve this breach stuff. It's costing them hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more, uh, every uh, for every day that they, they um, can't get their systems up and running. So my point is, is that a lot of this stuff will continue to happen. And, and let's face it, you know, you'll, you'll appreciate this. Most companies, you know, uh, they treat IT in a very transactional uh, in terms of budget, they t until they have a problem, until some but their companies get hacked, whether there's a ransomware attack or God forbid they, they someone hacks and steals a lot of information, then they get serious and says, "Well, now we do have to upgrade our, our security system. Now we have to. We may be a company that has you know 25,000 people in the field with with computers. Maybe we do need to have um, better security software on, on those client devices to make sure this kind of thing doesn't happen." And unfortunately, a lot of companies until, you know, it's kind of like earthquake insurance, you know, out in California, you don't have to get in earthquake insurance. I get it just for the peace of mind, frankly, because I'm, my luck will be an earthquake right now and we'll, we'll, the, the podcast will fail. But the, um, the reality is, is that most people don't worry about it until they have a problem, you know, and that's, unfortunately, that's when it's like. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, you know, and I agree with you in general, but I think that, and I, hopefully people don't get used to it, but I think there's something pernicious about, for the example you gave with this, uh, unfortunately, this lady who had a, had a ransom situation with her daughter where it was a phone call. There's something pernicious about that kind of experience that's, uh, that hits a bit more, maybe emotionally, I think people really run out of emotion, that uh, it hits more emotionally than someone stole my password or something, you know, where uh, you can, I think, I think there might, I'm not, there might be a bit of a boom in the security industry because like the, the kind of demos you can do when it comes to um, saying, showing what can happen, it can be a lot more, can, a bit, can be a bit more like a movie, right? Like this, I mean, this really is, this is literally taken what you just, the example you just gave, right? So uh, we'll see, we'll see. I, I, I might, I might have to eat my words uh, very soon. <laughs> but I feel like there you can you can really sell like hey this is a this, right, the whole demo could be just like this is very convincing wasn't it um, but it's not true you know yeah I mean the general rule that I kind of impart to people you know family members I get a lot of you know because of my podcast I get a lot of inquiries from from individuals is that you really have to you really have to guard your information in a very uh, tightly controlled and managed way and you know people who use smartphones for example. They're so excited when they see a new app and they download it. They just kind of willy-nilly hit the accept button when they see the terms and because they're not lawyers, they don't read the terms and conditions. And then they realize, and guess what? I just agreed to something to give away a piece of my privacy. Um, and uh, that's a shame because you know companies should do a better job of of of, of um, articulating what's required to use their app. And many, but in a way, because it, because it, it's a bit of an oligopoly, right? So they almost don't give you a choice. Like you kind of need this for work, and like you know, you don't really have an option. And sometimes these selections are. If you don't agree to the terms and conditions, they say, "Okay, good, see you later." Oh, we're, you're not, you can't get the app. Yeah, thank you for your time. Yeah, 
And a lot of people are using these apps because their company is using the app. And so their personal information goes through because their company, you know, so it becomes, uh, you know, they have quite a stranglehold. So, we'll, you know, we'll, anyway, I, I do want to move to another topic because uh, I think you, there's a lot of things that uh, you do know about, you do cover. I think the next thing I think would be smart homes. Um, that's a bit of a, um, so recently I met uh, someone who, uh, he works in a solar company and, and they're, what they're doing is very interesting where uh, what I did know is the solar uh, solar roofs, they they shut off if there's a leaf on it, right? So they, they, they the circuit doesn't complete and and uh, you start losing power very quickly. Uh, so it just shuts off. So you, you really have to maintain those roofs very well, but they have a technology that makes it so that's not true anymore. Um, and that got me really thinking about uh, home automation, smart home, but I think with that technology, you know, every the home the home unit is going to be quite self sustaining in the future. I guess that's that's with the with the cost of silicon moving down every, quite exponentially now. I think this this uh, AI revolution definitely helps. Like the money going into silicon is so much so that Nvidia is having a time hard time producing chips. I mean, that's, if that's not demand, I don't know what the what uh, what, what is it. And I think economies of scale will absolutely, um, you know, play its own part. Um, so just to bring it back, it's, uh, so what do you think sort of how the, the smart home industry or home and automation industries, how is it going to get affected by all this either directly or just by association? Um, and then, so what do you, how do you think, I think people have left that a little bit of all kinds of reasons. I think Tesla, uh, sorry, Elon Musk's and the Teslas of the world, I think they, they had a, uh, a business with that that they had to absorb. But, uh, so I think people aren't as excited. Also the capital cost is a lot higher. So it's. You know, it's hard to see the transactions, but uh, so yeah. So just just to give me, uh, so what do you? Th- how do you think that's going to evolve, and you think it's going to sort of come back in a different kind of way? When you say smart home, that's a big, big phrase that encompasses a lot of devices, smart speakers, IoT devices. There's literally hundreds of devices that are defined in that smart home category. That category still continues to grow pretty rapidly. Um, especially, it was growing rapidly before the pandemic. It got a kick in the pants during the pandemic because people were home and they said, well, if I'm home all the time, I might as well make my home into a smart home. Now, having said that, a couple of observations to make. You know, people have very modest definitions of what a smart home is. If you have a home that has no nothing that's smart about it, but you go out and buy an Alexa speaker and you buy a, a smart light bulb and you get fascinated by that I can use a digital assistant to turn the light on or turn the light off in a very binary way, that's something like George Jetson. People get very excited about that. That to me is very rudimentary. Where the where the real potential of the smart room is, is when you get your home outfitted with all kinds of connected devices, can the home become that smart that it, it you don't have to ask it anything. It just recognizes and does things by itself. For example, let's say that I have an entirely smart uh, connected home. I do, and I happen to have one because I'm in the business. That when I arrive home at night, the, uh, the, the smart home system can identify me because of my smartphone with NFC. Then it can say, well, Mark at home. So we're going to turn the air conditioner. It, know, it knows that the, the, it know, it's been shut off all day to save energy. It knows that it's already warm in the house. So it may be even anticipation, even before I arrive, I might be five miles away from home. It knows I'm coming home. It turns the air Yes, it can turn on the air conditioning in advance so you walk into a nice, cool home. Maybe, it, you know, in my case, it plays some Frank Sinatra music, so it makes me feel at home. Uh, it turns the lights on, and it, it might be a t- typical type of uh, an evening that it might, you know, there might be a, a lighting sh- scenario that I want. It turns my TV on to Sports Center, so I, 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 can, I don't even have to worry about turning the TV on. Um, there's a variety of different things that it could, it could do. Now, that's more, and that's more kind of an anticipation based home, smart home stuff based on AI capability. That to me, the vast part of the market hasn't gotten there yet. They're still kind of, you know, kind of engrossed in, oh, I just use Alexa, for example, to turn something on. My Alexa's going to go off in a second. I, the light just went on. But, but, but the, the thing is, is that that's where the opportunity is. Now, one thing about that you probably, you haven't asked about is that one thing that's interesting about the smart home is that you've got all these digital assistants. You've got app, you got Apple Siri, you go to Apple, you know, and by by extension, you've got Apple's HomeKit, which is their answer to the smart home, Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant, and those d- devices 
Unfortunately, they use different activation words. When you come home, some devices only work with Alexa, some devices work with Google Assistant, and you don't want to have to remember what activation word you want to use, you know? So there's an initiative out there called the Matter Initiative, M-A-T-T-E-R, and that's an initiative that's been in the market for about three years. It's finally starting to, you're start, finally starting to see devices with Matter compatibility. And what the advantage of that is, is that if you have a device, a smart light, a smart lock, that uh, has that ability to um, have matter capability, it can standardize on one, one on one activation phrase, regardless of what that device was designed to do, whether it's Apple, Google, or, or Amazon. So that's a big step in the right direction. The um, Those devices have been coming out slower than I think a lot of people wanted, but they are making progress. There have, are there are devices out in the place. They've gotten enormous support, I, that should be said. The, mat, you know, the Matter team is a, is a non-profit standards body that's connected connectivity standards. So that's a good sign. But it's going to be a few years until we see that be ubiquitous. When you walk into a Best Buy, you don't have to even ask the question. The device is already you know, Matter compatible. Now, the thing that's also nice about Matter, by the way, Chris, is that if, you, if you're a manufacturer and you make a device that's Matter compliant, that all, that those devices have to have a certain level of, of security capability. Uh, so, so there's a so security benefit to using matter compatible devices as well, because let's face it, a lot of people buy these cameras and devices on Amazon that are manufactured in China, that, which has very little security protocols. The default password to use them is password. You know, uh, my, 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 Gary just went off. I wish it, it would. I really wish Siri would be smart enough to know that I'm on a podcast. But the thing is, my point is, is that that's a real problem. You know, you go out and buy a webcam, you go out and buy a nanny cam, and as you know, it's, those are notorious for. There's websites out there that say, "Hey, you want you want to see someone's webcam that is not secure? Go go to this website." That's kind of what's when you think about it. But but I, I have a I have a lot. I think the smart home category is a category that's going to still continue to grow very rapidly. Um, people are still buying um, security cameras, whether they're outside. They buy security cameras on the inside, although for the most part, unless you're a business, you don't really. Most people don't want a security camera inside their house for privacy reasons. But you want a security camera, by the way, to monitor the perimeter of your property and the driveway and things like that. Um, another category that I've been doing some work for a great company called uh, UltraLock that's based out of here, and they are enormously successful on the um, on the uh, on Amazon. They've sold, I think, 700,000 smart locks, and they're, that, that's a category that is ripe for uh, growth because most people don't have smart locks on their door, you know, and, and there's convenience advantages, not just security advantages. You know, I'm not home, I wanna let the kids in, they forgot their keys, I can send them a one-time code to let them in. If you're an Airbnb property, you want to be able to let people in without having to be there. So that's another great usage model. But the whole smart home category is just right, right for for both. Right for opportunity. Yeah. So, um, but then, you know, you talked about the um, uh, the matter solution. But the first thing that came to mind is that it reduced the LTV of these, of, of, the, of the customer for any of these uh, company's lifetime lifetime value of the customer so you know why aren't they what's your incentive for not, not uh, what's your incentive for not blocking this i suppose right so how do they how do they see this uh this to look at the roster of players who's who signed up to, for this matter thing uh it's very impressive it's literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies and the chief members are, are companies like google apple amazon so i'm not worried about that too much i'm not worried about that too much so what what's we have within what's their incentive for letting it happen right because it, their whole the whole i think it may be customer convenience and that's just better for them but the the whole ecosystem idea actually just came from apple right they they, they people weren't doing ecosystems before apple sort of has said everything is going to be a variation of gray you know what i mean so why in the world are they you know not uh yeah not that, it's interesting you make that comment because if you think about it in the abstract Intuitively, you would think, you know, why would Apple and Amazon and Google, just to use those three guys, why would you, why would they want to cooperate together because they're competitors at the end of the day? 
and they have pri- and, they, and if they if one vendor has a smart lock and another person has a smart lock, well, our smart lock is better than their smart lock. Why do I want Why do I want to sign up to a to a standard that's going to be much more um, easier for you to use the devices, whatever brand you have? And I the answer is very simple. The smart home company, the big ones, realize that this comp- intercompatibility issue is so important that it's retarding growth. You know, and I think they're 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 willing to put that. They're willing. They're willing to put that consideration aside. Now, and I'll give you a statistic. At at Best Buy, uh, the you know, they have kind of the. Uh, uh, if you've ever you've been in Best Buy, I'm sure multiple times. They have a pretty big chunk of their real estate in the store dedicated to smart home devices. And most best, I have buy store within 20 feet of me. I can walk out to it. I go there to do testing of retail all the time. And that Best Buy store probably dedicates 100 square feet, which is big in a store, to smart home devices. I've been told, you know, I will, I will, I'll take Best Buy out of it. But at retail, when someone goes out and buys a smart light or a smart lock, the return rates on smart home devices is something in the neighborhood of 25%. One in four devices get returned at re- retail. And when they and when a, when a Best Buy, for example, takes that back and they examine the device, there's nothing wrong with the device. It's not defective. They just couldn't get it to work. You know, so there is a... I, there, if you want to get this whole, uh, you know, you know, really kind of, really turbocharge uh, consumer satisfaction and make these things work, you know, imagine if, you know, just to use a stupid analogy, if 25 years ago when CDs were still around and you went to a music store and you bought a CD and you took it home and you popped it into your CD player and it didn't work, you'd say, Jesus, you know, my God, you know, all I want to do is play the CD that I bought. Obviously, there was a stint, and even though there were multiple players that made CD players, whether it was Sony or Panasonic or whatever brand, that you knew that CD, that music CD, was going to work. So I think there's some wisdom kicking in here where the major manufacturers realize, yeah, maybe it might, um, it may not be the right thing for us from a competitiveness standpoint because it kind of goes in the opposite direction. But we really believe that customer satisfaction and interoperability and, um, and enhancing someone's lives and getting this stuff uh, working up, you know, very quickly without requiring a PhD um, is worth it, you know, versus, you know, not having that kind of capability that hopefully will be delivered by matter. Mark Vanna, thank you so much for coming on. Where can they find you? I think you have a podcast, you have a lot of places, but uh, hopefully you have more. But I think if someone wants to reach out to you you, and hear what you you have to say, I'd love to. No, that'd be uh, great. You I'd can reach me it. on Twitter or X as it's now known. Uh, my handle is at Mark at Mark Vena Tech yeah. Guy, M A R K V E N V E N A Tech Guy. Uh, my website is uh, smarttechresearch.net. Very simple to find. And uh, this was exciting. I was re- I'm really glad we took the time, and I hope I uh, provide some insights that you didn't have before. Definitely, absolutely. Thank you so much hey, for coming on. Again. I really have appreciate it. Have a nice it. rest of the weekend, Thank Chris. You. Bye. I will.